When I first started trying to understand the covenant that God has extended to us, I understood that the Abrahamic covenant was a unilateral promise by God. The Davidic covenant was a unilateral promise by God, but that the Mosaic covenant was an if-then covenant. So remember that the Abrahamic covenant is that God made a promise to Abraham that he was going to have children as numerous as the stars in the sky. Was this a unilateral promise or was there an expectation that Abraham obey God? Did Abraham already demonstrate himself to be obedient to God and faith was attributed to him? God already knew that Abraham was going to be obedient to him. So if Abraham had turned from God, then God was not going to continue to keep his promise if Abraham did not keep his oath with God. And you can see this in the way that God states it in Genesis 17, 1 through 2. I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. So God will fulfill the Abrahamic covenant at the end of this age when Israel inherits the promised land. He has already partially fulfilled his promise um, seed to Abraham in giving him Isaac. And there's also the fulfillment of the covenant in Abraham inheriting children as numerous as the stars in the sky. In the Davidic covenant, God promised David and Israel that Christ would descend from David's lineage and the tribe of Judah, and that Christ would establish an eternal kingdom. So we see this in 2 Samuel 7, 1 Chronicles 17, 2 Chronicles 6. And there was a time when I thought that this was also non-contingent, that this was just a promise that God sort of randomly made to David. But that's not actually true. And God even acknowledges in Second Chronicles 7 when he's talking to Solomon after Solomon has dedicated the temple, as for you, if you walk before me faithfully as David your father did and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with your with David your father when I said you shall never fail to have a successor to rule over Israel. And even for the sake of the promise that God made to David and his loyalty to David for having walked faithfully before him, when Solomon turned from God to serve false gods and the idols of his foreign wives, God chose to split up the kingdom through Rehoboam, which, is, which was Solomon's son, rather than doing that through Solomon. And that was for the sake of his promise to David. But you can see here that David walked before him faithfully. If David had gone to serve other gods, the covenant would have been revoked, just as the covenant was revoked in the Mosaic covenant. The thing is, you don't need a covenant. You don't need a, an agreement something that is formal if you're just giving a gift and making a promise to someone that you're going to do something. People sign contracts, covenants, when they're making an agreement that I'm going to do my part and you're going to do your part. And now we're outlining the contingencies and the stipulations of the agreement that we're making here in this covenant, here in this contract. And so previously I had understood that there were unilateral contracts and that there were if-then contracts. And now I understand that that's baloney. That isn't the way that God operates. If he's going to give you something, then he just gives it to you. And it's on you to recognize that he has given something to you and to be grateful for it. And unfortunately, God's given us a lot of things that we just kind of like, oh, well, okay, this is just a part of me. Health, beauty, provision, we don't realize that that's been given to us until it's taken away. I was healthy and strong all my life until God made me sick and brought me to the brink of death and left me with weakness, with weakness in my body. He continued to afflict me because he knows what's, be what's best. He knows what's needed to keep me in line. You know, even in the covenant that God made with Noah, we would even say God didn't make the covenant with Noah or through Noah so randomly. Noah was the only person, the one person who God chose to build the ark, to warn everyone, and then he saved Noah's family through Noah. Because of Noah's obedience and because of Noah's faith, he chose Noah to make that covenant with. Now, why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because 
Counterfeit Christianity does not seem to understand what is a basic understanding to pagans. Like pagans don't go around thinking, well, we'll just, you know, sort of on our own word. I'll do my part, you do yours. Pagans also don't go to the effort of writing up a contract or a covenant if there aren't contingencies by which someone is going to receive a reward because that's a waste of time. If you want to give someone a gift, then just give them the gift. But if there's a requirement in order for that person to keep a gift or obtain a reward, then both of us need to understand what the stipulations are. And that's what's been given to us in the teachings of Christ and the apostles and what God established through the Israelites and through these covenants. The covenant of circumcision, for example. You're going to do this thing in your physical flesh so that you can remember to be circumcised in heart from the sinful flesh from which you, of which you don't see. You need to keep these laws, fasten these laws to your right hand and your forehead. And so Jews wore phylacteries, these little boxes that have the law written in really small print inside of the box. They wore that on their forehead. Christians don't do that because we are supposed to understand that the Holy Spirit writes the law on the tablets of our heart and mind. But God gave something physical in order for you to understand what you're supposed to be doing, always meditating on his law, always keeping that on your mind, on your forehead, in your deeds, your right hand. God does not make covenants if he just wants to give you a gift. There's no point to that. Then you just give a gift. But if there's a requirement in order for you to receive that covenant, then the stipulations need to be laid out. And those stipulations were laid out in the law. And when Jesus came, he said he had not come to abolish the law, that nothing would be abolished or removed from the law. And that anyone who taught people that anything was to be removed from the law would be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Believe me, they will not make it into the kingdom of heaven that is what they will be called in the kingdom of heaven. Because no one who teaches falsely is going to make it to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus even said, if your righteousness doesn't surpass that of the Pharisees, who he did, whom he did say were teaching correctly but did not live that out themselves. So he said the Pharisees are not going to make it into the kingdom of heaven and that you won't if your righteousness does not surpass theirs. So he's not saying in saying that they will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, he's not saying that they're going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. They will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus said is, I've come to fulfill the law. And then in his teachings, he helped you to understand what he was fulfilling in the law. Adding this command to love one another, that fulfills all laws. And then he demonstrated for you what that looks like. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye. But I'm telling you, in this commandment to love, pray for your enemies. Give to those who ask of you. If someone's trying to sue you, give them your cloak too. Bless those who curse you. Don't harbor anger in your heart. Because if you're harboring anger in your heart, then you are committing murder. Do not lust in your heart. Because if you're lusting in your heart, you are committing adultery. The fulfillment of the law is found in this addition to love. That's what makes you realize what you must become, what your heart must become, how to become holy as God is holy. Because it's pretty easy for me anyway. It was easy for me not to commit adultery. It was easy for me not to murder. It was easy for me not to do a lot of things in the law. But Jesus helped us to understand that Everything has to be done in love and that that will fulfill the entire law. So you don't remove anything from the law, but you do in love. If everything is through that perspective of love, then you have fulfilled the law. Solomon said something in 2 Chronicles 6.14 that's really important that helps us to understand what the Israelites understood about God, what Christians should be understanding about God. I mean, even as the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness and they disobeyed God, setting up the calf, uh, you know, being too afraid to go in and take the land of Canaan, he killed many of them. He wiped many of them out, revoking his covenant from them. Here's what Solomon said. 
Lord, the God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven or on earth. You who keep your covenant of love with. Okay, so now he's going to tell you with whom he keeps his covenant. Because he doesn't keep the covenant with everyone. He only keeps the covenant with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. I don't know if you realize how difficult it is to continue wholeheartedly in his ways because his ways are not our ways. His ways are not what our flesh wants and his ways are certainly not what the world is doing. So to continue wholeheartedly in his ways is a very difficult thing to do. It's something that our flesh fights against. It's something that the world fights against and makes it increasingly difficult to fulfill. I will give you one simple example, something very simple. It should be simple to follow God's Sabbaths. God's Sabbaths are set according to the moon. When the crescent moon shows up, which is the historical biblical new moon, when that crescent moon shows up, that's the first day of the month, which means it kicks out not only the previous month, but the previous day. And if you're actually following that calendar, then you will understand that God's Sabbaths are not on the same days every month. What is Saturday? What is Sunday? That's the Roman model. That's not the model that God established. Will, will Jews follow that? No, reformed Jews follow that. Those who have prostituted themselves to the ways of the Romans, they also have changed God's calendar and prostituted themselves to the Gregorian calendar of the Romans. And so if God's Sabbaths are on different days each month, how are you going to explain that to your employer? That's a hard thing to explain to your employer. And in fact, you don't need to explain it to your employer, but you do need to take those Sabbaths off. How easy is that, guys? For those of you who are self-employed, okay, no problem. But if you have an employer that you need to go and say, listen, I'm going to give you sort of the mapped out days that I need to take off for the rest of the year. I have a personal matter. How easy is that to do? It's not. It is not easy. It would have been a lot easier if we were separated from the rest of the world and we were in Jerusalem and we all worked together and we separated ourselves from other nations, wouldn't it? But because we've been scattered among the nations, it's incredibly difficult. And some of us are really suffering in that right now. I know people who are really suffering, who have taken other jobs, who were willing to lose their current job, who are still trying to sort this out with God because they do believe. But this world makes it virtually impossible to live a life in him. God has a way. I know people, myself included, who have given up entire careers, who have given up their degrees, their doctorates, who are living paycheck to paycheck in terrible neighborhoods because they will not compromise their integrity to go work in a discipline or a field that they know is antichrist, that they know is doing wrong. The word says, Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven or on earth, you who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. That is one thing that God has said. This will be a sign on your forehead and on your right hand. A sign of what? As to whether you're in the covenant, guys. As to whether you belong to him. As to whether you're fulfilling your end of the agreement. That is one simple thing. Keep his Sabbaths. Don't work on his Sabbaths. The world makes it virtually impossible to do. Here's my point. There's a contingency there. This is not a unilateral gift. There is a contingency. There are requirements. God has not just handed this over to you. You must fulfill your covenant. Okay, so how about this? This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. How easy is that? How easy is it when you're waiting on God to provide for your basic needs, when you're suffering for him and have given everything, everything to serve him, to obey him. Now you're wondering what's ahead of me. Is he going to take care? Is he going to fulfill? Is he going to keep his promises to me? And he's not talking because he does that. There are times when he is building your faith where he doesn't talk and it feels like he's totally forsaking you. It feels like he's nowhere to be found and you start to wonder, like, what, what have I believed? And yet he says in repentance and rest, this is what he expects you to do. Rest in him. Rest in him who you do not see or hear. 
And you are going to need to remind yourself of who he is, who he says he is, who he's been in your life and what he has built. You're going to need to not waver in your faith and believe that he knows what's best. Look at all the things Job was going through. And he was saying along the way, I want to speak to my God. I want to hear from him. I want to understand why he's doing this. His own wife told him, just curse God and die. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. That is the opposite of what you want to do in those moments. You want to take it up by your own power, by your by the work of your own hands. Quietness and trust is your strength. Turns out this is a hard covenant, guys. And one that the world is not going to affirm. No one else around you is going to be saying these things to you. They're going to be saying things like curse God and die. Like, boy, you gave up what? You're an idiot. Why would you do that? That's a series of bad decisions. Why would you do that? That's just irresponsible. That's not faith. That's irresponsible. No one's going to validate or affirm you. Don't expect that in this world. You have to hold on to what God has taught you and what his word says. And it's hard. And while you're waiting and while God is not talking and you're needing that wisdom and you're needing that instruction and you're needing for him to... Just respond. Do something. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. He's going to whisper to you or remind you of things that you've read in the Bible. Like the example of Ahab in 1 Kings 29, excuse me, 21, 29, when God had said that he was going to bring catastrophe on him. He said, dogs are going to eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city and the birds will feed on those who die in the country. He, he prophesied some really terrible things that were going to hap happen to Ahab. And, when, and, and Ahab was a very, very wicked man. Remember, that this, is, this is the king who was married to Jezebel. In fact, the word says there was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. Look at the way that he says that the word says that, who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. That's what we do when we do evil. We sell ourselves into bondage. We sell our lives. He behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols like the Amorites the Lord drove out before Israel. When Ahab heard these words, what God was going to bring on him, he tore his clothes, put sackcloth, put on sackcloth and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. No one even does that today. I mean, we look at this and we think, man, Ahab is one of the most wicked people in the Bible. And yet no one's willing to do this today. Who does this when they're going through something? Who fasts and recognize that, recognizes that God is bringing something on them or that he's calling them in? No one. You look at what the world's calling global warming. Who's fasting right now? Who's fasting and recognizing that in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 that God said, when I do these things to the earth, this is what you are to do. No one's recognizing this as God's wrath. No one's returning to him. No one's repenting. Now look at what he says in verse 28. Then the word of the Lord came. To Elijah the Tishbite, have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in, this, in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. God had mercy on Ahab. So there's something about fasting. There's something about having a, humbling ourselves and having a contrite heart that is really, really powerful before God. God will remind you of things like Esther. And how Esther was going to approach the king on penalty of potentially dying because she did not have permission to just go and approach the king. But she needed to let him know about this decree that Haman had made against the Jews. So what was the wisdom that Esther had? She called all the Jews together and all of her servants and told them not to eat or drink for three days and to appeal to the Lord. And God turned the heart of her husband toward her. And he not only did that, but he made the Jews victorious over their enemies. And he not only did that, but he turned the plans of Haman, their enemy, who called for the annihilation of the Jews. He turned his own plans against him and had him impaled on the very pole that he had set up for Mordecai the Jew. Fasting, returning to God, a humble and contrite heart. That's what God wants. Isaiah 66, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you will build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand is made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. That's the one he's going to listen to. That's the one who has an audience with him. That is 
the power that we have is to lower ourselves and get into the correct posture before him, then he will listen, then he will respond. Psalm 51, verse 16, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it, and you do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. This is our covenant. Our covenant is obedience, reliance, and submission. Our covenant is love, obedience to all of the laws. So our covenant is love. Obey the covenant of love without neglecting the law. Here's why I'm saying that. The world has a different definition of love. And so if you think that all you have to do is go around loving people, but you neglect the stipulations of the law, you neglect what God has established, you will have believed in vain. You will be subject to the definitions of the world because they think they're loving, guys. They think that tolerance of sin, they think that inviting everyone, I heard this on a video, on a, a, a news clip yesterday from a counterfeit pastor who admittedly behaves in homosexual behavior, saying that everyone has a seat at that table, and that's a lie. I don't know what Bible she's reading it, but it, it's not the Bible of God. Everyone does not have a seat at that table. The only ones who have a seat at that table are those who are doing the will of God. And so someone who's preaching that is deluded about what table they're actually sitting at. God's definition of love is not inclusion. God's definition of love is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And if that is the truth, then you will obey everything that he has said. You will study and meditate your heart and mind on everything that he has said. And you will teach others accordingly. And you will also speak the truth on the authority of the one who sent you, not on the authority of the world. So see, that person who was speaking on that news clip yesterday believes that they're speaking in love because they're speaking according to the world's definition of inclusion and tolerance of sin and don't judge me. And by that, they teach people not to discern or test the spirit, which is also commanded in the word. You can't eliminate discerning the fruit and testing the spirit from the commands of God and then throw that into your definition of judgment because that is a form of judgment that you are required to participate in. So the form of judgment that you're not supposed to be participating in must mean something else. You are not to condemn. I don't get to say that that person won't be saved at a certain point. I don't know that, but they sure as heck are not being saved right now. And so I have a responsibility to discern that fruit and stay the heck away from them. I don't join myself with prostitutes like that. That is a person who has sold themselves to the world. They have prostituted themselves to the world and its definitions. And not only that, they've set themselves up in a position to teach others to do the same. If they continue in that behavior, they will be thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. But I don't know that they will. But the word tells me all of those things. And so it's my requirement in this covenant to discern that and to teach you accordingly. Because if I love God, I love his truth. I love his law. I speak on his authority. I'm not afraid to tell you that. I am able to speak with conviction and boldness as empowered by the Holy Spirit to tell you what the truth is. People who love as the world does will not do that. I hope that this video has helped you to understand what your covenant actually is. Your covenant is a posture of the heart. That's where you're going to be justified. It's not an outside in. It's an inside out. So indeed, your deeds, your behaviors, your thoughts, your beliefs, the way you speak, all of those things need to be congruent and do need to be reflective of one who has a heart for God and of one who is fulfilling this covenant. But you're not going to be able to work yourself into having that heart. The work that is required is in the heart then it will come out of your right hand, your forehead, and your mouth. That's your covenant. And no one's talking about this. If someone were to do a video on what is your covenant, they're going to say, oh, well, here's what it says in the law, and here's what it says in the Ten Commandments. If they even acknowledge that the law is even relevant, most people are going to say, well, you just need to believe and declare with your mouth 
and they'll neglect everything else that's in the word because what they do is they cherry pick scripture for their own narrative. So just believe more in the grace, in the unilateral gift that Jesus has given you. There's nothing you need to do, no covenant, no suffering, no cross to bear, no nothing. I'm talking to you about a posture. I'm talking to you about the work that needs to be done in your heart. That is your covenant. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And if you do, then that means that this is all you do in a day. This is all that occupies you. What would the Lord have me do? Have I pleased him? Laying your heart bare before him every single day. Okay, Lord, search my heart. What would you like to talk with me about today? What do you want from me today? How do I need to change? How do I need to be purified, made spotless, and refined? What is the work I need to do today? And then you will understand that as long as you are on this earth, that is a covenant that you are continuing to work out until he says, all right, you're done. All right, your time is complete. You have done what you were supposed to do. Well done, good and faithful servant. But it has to be until the day you die. Please discern this message with God.